Hello, beautiful listeners. It's your host, Tembi Locke. Welcome to Lifted, a podcast that pulls back the curtain on creativity, resilience, and the extraordinary moments when everything changes. My guest is none other than Katie Parla, a Rome-based food writer, culinary guide, and New York Times bestselling author. She grew up in New Jersey with parents who met in the restaurant business, so food is very much deep within her DNA. She went to Yale University, moved to Italy, and got a master's degree in Italian gastronomic culture. And for the past 20 years, Katie has been an on-screen expert. You've seen her on CNN Searching for Italy with Stanley Tucci and Netflix Chef's Table. She also hosts an Emmy-nominated food and travel series entitled Katie Parla's Rome. There are so many surprises in this conversation, including how and why being a New York Times bestselling cookbook author was surprisingly an unsustainable business model. Katie is the real deal. She tells it straight, and I guarantee you she will change how you think about travel, specifically travel to Italy. She will inspire you to perhaps think that maybe traffic, trade, enterprise, and antiquity in Rome are more interesting than an Aperol Spritz. Let's dig in. Hello, Katie Parla. Welcome to the Lifted Podcast. Ciao. Ciao, Bella. Dove sei? Sto a Roma, nell'appartamento. Caldissimo, poi. Sto a morire. Sudare. A sudare. For those listening, Katie is in Rome. She's in her apartment, and she just said it's very hot, and she's sweating. What's the temperature <laughs> there right now? Uh, 30 degrees, probably. It's not even that hot. It's just a little early. I am so excited to talk to you today. I am so honored that you honored would like you. totally sit down. I know you're in the middle of everything. Your amazing book tour. First of all, I'm going to hold this up right now. This book is everything. I'm so grateful that you enjoy it. No, no, no. It's everything on so many levels. There's the work and the research and the intimacy of this book. And then there's the fact that this is some parla publishing too. So we're going to talk about that as well. I think I want to start with a kind of origin story piece. And I guess the first question that came to my mind was, in your home, who cooked? Mom cooked every day and every single day. And I wasn't allowed anywhere near the kitchen. Which really uh, was really shaped my relationship with restaurants because I love hospitality. I love being a guest. I love having guests. And so it was actually in a restaurant's the wrong word. Like, you know, Chuck's Wings in Princeton, New Jersey, Hoagie Haven, like places that you go out and eat food where no one's cooking, there's no baggage. And it's like, I'm going to pick out what I want and I'm going to eat that thing. Um, and my mom, you know, is still a very enthusiastic cook. She cooks every day now for my nephews and my sister. So I just, uh, I wasn't allowed anywhere near the stove. So I didn't learn that much at home. <laughs> but your family was in the food business and in the industry of in, in New Jersey. So this, in is Jersey. A, this is an Italian American family as in the last name Parla, which means to speak. Katie speaks. Katie speaks. Self-fulfilling prophecy. My dad had a restaurant until uh, about six months ago when he sold it, uh, but he was always front of house. And so I guess like, like popcorn and nachos were a vibe when we would go hang with my dad. My parents got divorced when I was really little. So we'd go on the weekends and like a lot of root beer, a lot of popcorn, a lot of junk food. And it was the best, honestly. And I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, his mother, who is a Polish woman who completely adopted her Italian American husband's food requests and was an incredible cook and baker. So when I was in the kitchen, it was usually like making breakfast with her on a Saturday morning while like, you know, sipping some soda that I wouldn't have been allowed to at home. (laughs) So your grandmother adopts if you will, her husband, who is an Italian American, his food culture, and she is feeding that back to him. And so therefore that is your, your understanding of Italian American cuisine is through a Polish lens. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 
on my mom's side, my grandmother had celiac disease. And so it wasn't like she was out there like rolling sfolia all the time. On the contrary, pasta was not really such a part of the ritual. And she was also like a additional generations back Italian. So I've got like great grandparents and then great, great grandparents. And each generation, there's like a dilution, of course, of the Italian culture. And so I think the Italian American bond is really coming through my Polish grandmother, ironically. I know for me, I, I've written about food tangentially. I'm sort of a storyteller in another way, but food was the conduit through which and having been married to a chef. But for you, was there a, a moment when you were like, this is the path I'm taking? Did it come in college? Did it come after college? Like, I, I feel like this is my calling because it feels to me like a calling for you. You do something more than just give us recipes from Italy. That's cool. No, you're going, it is, it is a kind of the intersection of archaeology and history and culture. And then it's capturing lost, the loss or, or, or sort of waning arts of certain processes around preservation or the acquisition or the cultivation of things. And you are um, holding up food traditions in Italy and translating them back to us as an American audience. Is that a fair assessment of what you do in part? That's a, that's a very generous translation of what I do. And I do it because I have a huge responsibility to the people who share their kitchen, their recipes, and their stories with me who need a translator for an Anglophone audience who wouldn't otherwise be able to tell their stories. Um, the, uh, it's cooking and storytelling can often intersect, but at times those are different skill sets that people hold. But I, you know, in terms of how I came into food, like I always was obsessed with food. I always worked in restaurants. Like my first job was at the bagel store in my town. When I went to college, I worked at a pizzeria. I was always throwing parties and having like late night cook-offs. And so food was always like the thing, but I didn't know you could do a job in food that wasn't in a restaurant. I wish I had been creative enough or had deduced like I have cookbooks, someone has to write them, but it, I never put it together. And all I knew I was very, I was very good at memorizing dates and slides in art history class. So I was like, that's obviously what I have to do. I know, I know, I see you. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm not good at like economics. Science is fine, but I'm great at this, like naming the Mycenaean gate and when it was built and like all the theory around it. So that's obviously my future. And that's what brought me to Italy. It was only when I moved here 20 years ago that I started doing like actual studies in food because that was an option. The University of Rome has a master's program in Italian gastronomic culture. You know this, every single person in the entire country has a sommelier certification. Like it's a casual course that everyone takes. Everyone's got everyone's got the, cert the certificate. And so I think just because food, certainly food studies in North America have gained a, a little bit of recognition and acceptance uh, but still lack credibility to some extent. In Italy, it's a long established tradition, studying food, food systems, uh, food ways, and recording recipes alongside that. Did you find when you moved to Italy 20 years ago, as an American woman, was there a barrier to entry in terms of people gaining trust with people that you were seeking out who whose stories you wanted to sort of understand, unpack. Was there like, was there, was there a sense of skepticism? What was that like, both as an American and as a woman? You know, when it came to my subjects, I never encountered friction or skepticism. If I was visiting a rural trattoria in Irpinia, no one would ever dismiss me because I'm a foreign woman. Not a thing. Now, a chef in Rome who is meant to be like cosmopolitan and worldly and like have a brain and stuff could certainly be inappropriate and overstep boundaries. There's a lot of like face caressing that goes on. It's like, get your get your hand off of my face immediately. And then in terms of being a, an American or just generally a foreigner in in an Italian food criticism setting, I think over time I 
I built out like a body of work and cookbooks and things that people have grown to trust. But certainly early on when I was writing for an Italian uh, food website and I was writing things about Italian places, I would get a lot of negative commentary. But if I was writing about a restaurant in Barcelona or a deli in New York, then people were like, oh my God, you're amazing. So there was a skepticism about my ability to interpret the culture that I had chosen and also studied professionally. Uh, and like, a, a it was sort of assumed, like I'm no expert on New York delis. I like them. I can tell you some stuff about them, but that shouldn't be where people are trusting my uh, judgment and advice. I would love if you could, for listeners, talk about your philosophy on the power of food as a unifier across culture. Like what is the, you know, we, you and I are both familiar with the power of the table culture in Italy, right? It looms, it was one of the first things as an American when I was studying in Italy and living with an Italian family, I was like, holy moly, like the table culture in within, I thought maybe that's just this one particular family. And of course, over time, I realized, no, 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 the table, it's sacrosanct, <laughs> you know, being here and what we do at the table, how we converse, how the meals come out, it, what courses. And I feel as though that is that at the table, so much culture is transmitted generation to generation in a way that we don't quite have here in the States. That's my assessment. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, you encounter people at the table here in so many different ways. It can be in a traditional family setting. I, I live in Rome where a lot of, a lot of people here are not from here. And so they're only engaging with their family at holidays. And thank God I've been invited to so many Easter's and so many uh, Ferragosto feasts to see that interaction happen when families have to pack in all of their like communication, affection, anger, frustration into like a long three day weekend. Like one of my favorite ways that people engage around the table here is actually not at no table at all, but standing up and having this convivial moment, having a, an affordable bite in the market in Palermo or in Pina Seca in Naples where you find this rare instance in which people of different backgrounds and social classes are actually interacting um, in a way that is profound and people are engaging. They're talking about politics. I mean, soccer by politics. I meant soccer. Um, they're talking about like, you know, the reflecting on the flavor of that particular arancina or, uh, or that pizza that day they're, they're having a, a really tactile moment and sharing that with someone, a stranger often. Um, and I think that's that's really beautiful. And uh, and it also allows really anyone to parachute into a moment of Italian culture without having to have that in, that invite to a family feast or, uh, or a, a group of friends that gathers on the weekends to share meals. What I love in what you just shared, which is something that is very hard for me, at least, to translate back to Americans, is this, people have this idea of like, what Italy, an idea of Italy, let's say they're very American, sort of informed by media, by film, by all the, of what Italy should be, all the beautiful postcards, all the things, right? And then there's Rome and then there's Palermo, which, you know, I know Palermo fairly well. And when I get to Palermo, I'm like, where, what is actually, this is, this is a no, um, uh, I haven't seen this in film. I haven't seen this in television. And that's the real intersection of so many cultures. I know you give tours to Americans who come. Do you invite them and take them to places like this on your tours? Do you find that they are interested in that? Or are they people coming to Italy looking just for that sort of iconic, what is familiar, what has been shared with them via you know, media over decades? I'm sure that I've disappointed many people who have only experienced Italy through TikTok and Instagram uh, by refusing them, by refusing to uh, 
help them eat or drink certain things. <laughs> like I, I mean, I have, I have very strong ideas about how to communicate uh, food culture in Rome. And I hesitate to say Roman food culture because there are many cuisines here and many incarnations of, of dining. Um, my, my tours are uh, neighborhood immersions. So we're not just there like funneling food into our face. We're talking about the fascist era public housing development of the Triumphale district and how that informs the market space and the way that people interact with food. And yes, we're going to eat a little porchetta at the same time. But if they want to have like that porchetta over there, we're not going to have it because this is the porchetta that we're going to get. And here's why. So um, yeah, I think if... If people have never encountered my work and don't know that I am not about that romantic stereotype, then they might be a little bummed when I tell them we're not going to have an Aperol spritz right now. But please, I invite you to go to Padova. This year, more than any other year, there are first time visitors. So many people have contacted me and said, I've never come to Italy. People are really transformed by the pandemic and are taking that trip that they had delayed their whole lives. And so they have the sense that they need to eat the best of everything. And I like, in a way I'm like, I can actually help you do that. Um, but we're going to talk about what, like how dangerous it is to call this the best and this the best, because that, I mean, that means eliminating a whole set of other stories. Exactly. Exactly. And they're looking for, and that, you know, there is that American obsession with if I'm somewhere, I, as an American, I must have the best, the top that, and it is, it is such a um, myopic, way of, of of first of all looking at the world and then as you said excluding whole other narratives like well, who determines what is you know the best and why and where you know what what what, what white male decided <laughs> the net net of what you give people is something so much richer and deeper than being able to come back stateside with bragging rights of I had the best pizza in wherever. No, you had a different experience. And I know um, a deeper experience that hopefully bridges cultures in a new way, that hopefully you understand your place in the world in a different way. You understand um, movement and migration in, an, a, in a new way. That that is um, an offering and kind of in a ministry <laughs> that, you know, through food that you're doing something so much bigger. Yeah, I would also just add, you do not have to pay me money for this information. There's tons of free stuff on my website. So you have all the parlor picks broken down into categories. I tell you where you just need to bite the bullet, let yourself get abused by the servers in order to have a special dish, um, where you need to like make the trek on the tram out to get a delicious bite. But, you know, I, of course, I'm happy to, to have, to earn a living doing tours, but I also, I want people to have that info no matter what. So katieparlo.com has got it all. Let's talk a little bit about Sicily, because in your book, Food of the Italian Islands, you're hitting all the islands, but Sicily, which of course, you know, from, from scratch, I have a personal relationship with, and my real sort of zone that I play in in Sicily is the province of Palermo in and around Cefalu, but going inward into the Madonia mountains, Cerda, which is a town that literally is the car the carciofi, the artichoke sort of a festival is like its whole thing. People come from all over Sicily just to have the artichokes there. I know you're not into Taormina. I could live without it. I could live without it too. And it was so interesting, you know, and 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 Taormina is aesthetically all the things. It's postcard, it's pretty, it's all, it's it's wonderful. Experientially for me, it's a quick pass through and then you don't kind of need to go back there. It's not a revisit deep in your experience because as you have said, both in the book and online that it was created for an Anglo audience to experience Sicily. No one likes it when you yuck their yum, right? So I, I get it. People love Taormina, but I would say, pause on your love for Taormina. Go visit the rest of Sicily. It'll take several years. And then get back to me about which place. 
feels the best to be in and which one expresses Sicilian identity. I mean, Tarmina, if you go to Tarmina, you can like interchange Tarmina and Capri in a lot of ways. Um, which for me, that doesn't feel like that cool of an Italy experience, but everyone can, you know, it's free to do whatever they want. Although they should go to Palermo first. What city do you find yourself like, oh, I think I need to lean in there or go back to that. There was something more I still need to understand about this place. I mean, I love Catania. It's wild, but I am obsessed with Palermo. It's freaking amazing. Um, the, you know, like the mosaics, the uh, intarsia, marble altars, the street food, the people, the noise, the smells, the city plan, or sometimes lack thereof. Yeah, lack thereof. It's so, there's so much energy there. There is art. There's music. Sometimes you'll see a pony running down the street for some reason. And there, there's just like the sea is right. It has like all the most stimulating things. So if you thrive in like a poolside villa situation, it might not be your cup of tea. But if you need to like go and like charge yourself up with human energy, that's the spot. It's also one of the more open-minded places in Italy as a port city. Um, it has absorbed countless generations of migration um, and Palermitani see that as a plus. They see that as a cool part of their culture and not as a, as a negative part that has diluted the culture. So I often try to talk about the difference between coastal Sicily and the interior. Have you spent a lot of time in the interior? And if so, which towns sort of speak to you and why? I, I love the Entroterra. Enna and Caltanissetta are very cool. My family comes from Villa Rosa near Enna. And... I think probably most of the most of the time, like if you add up all the minutes spent there, has just been like driving through wheat fields, um, dodging sheep uh, when I'm not paying enough t attention on the road, um, and in in and around Mount Etna. Those are the interior spaces that I've that I've devoted the most time to, and and they're haunted and and strange at times, and like superstitious and really uh, opaque at moments. And I really enjoy the experience of trying to like understand a place, um, just randomly passing by, coming in, parachuting in, trying to chat people up at the bar, have a snack, see what the place is about. But the coast, the coast is my jam. Well, yes. And the coast, it's interesting. So as was explained to me and you're, you know, your knowledge is 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 probably is definitely more informed with formal education than mine is sort of informal talking to people. But coastal Italy, you will find the Greek influence. Those were the maritime people who were coming and going, and the Greeks set up along the coast. When you get into the interior, that is the Arabic influence in Sicily. And so culturally, a whole just when we talk about that sort of opaque that sort of, um, and, and also people who were invaded and aware of invasion. And so therefore very reticent to sort of open their doors to strangers because who who's coming in. And that intersection over many centuries of many different cultures, but with that specifically Arabic influence, like my husband's town, there's a lot of the words there in town, which are Arabic. The church is built on, on top of the foundation of an of a mosque, right? And so that is very much a part of the culture. It's in the food, it's in the language, and it is in the character of the people. And Sicily is, that is what continually fascinates me, you know, uh, 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 about Sicily and, and particularly the interior. Yeah. And what's so fascinating is that people still do identify as Greek or Carthaginian, even though there have been several dozen other cultures to pass through. So uh, my people, the Palermo people, that was all like Carthaginian territory. And then the other two thirds of the coast was Greek and people still are like, si, mom, e la Sicilia greca. But it's like, is it Greek? Is it Greek? It's like Byzantine Greek than ancient Greek? That was more recent. But anyway, um, that, um, that sort of ancient identity that people still embrace is so interesting. 
What is a favorite food tradition in Sicily for you? All. <laughs> no, I mean, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be the, you know, I love going to the Tavola Calda and having like a, I love eating out of aluminum containers. I hope that's not bad for me. It might be. So, <laughs> but can you, just for our audience and listeners, Tavolo Calda, can you explain to people what that is? So it, it is a hot, literally the words are table, <laughs> hot, hot table. That's what yeah, it means. Like, usually they're steam tables. Um, sometimes there are just prepared foods in little aluminum containers, but it's the, it's a cafeteria. It's where workers go or where beach goers go to scoop up some food because they don't have that much time or they don't have that much cash. And so a favorite Sicilian ritual of mine is heading into um, the Eastern part of Palermo, finding a gritty little tavola calda, getting some uh, analetti, the ring-shaped pasta with ragu that's inevitably been dusted with breadcrumbs and then baked in the oven until crispy. I love drinking a, a warm Messina beer at a flimsy Peroni plastic table next to like the garbage man and the postal worker and the granny. And those are, those are moments. Like I, I, I'm like a 43 year old American lady living in Rome. Like those, those aren't people that I get to interact with a lot in my life. And so having food with those people and having food that everyone can have access to, though, that's my favorite food ritual. And it's not always the best. It's not the best. It's not the greatest, but it's not always just about, you know, going for whatever the top 10 most delicious Palermo bites are. Do you feel that tourism can play a role in preserving food, food cultures in, in places like Sicily? And if so, how? I think a lot about this question because there is, I think, instantly a stigma when people hear tourism, they see it as a destructive force. Many times it is, but in places where, uh, in places where the population is depleted, or with the population's income has been depleted by youth unemployment or um, financial crises, which we've had several of in the past two decades. People making food can't stay in business unless they have customers. So is, is a stall in a market going to survive if it just has the local people of that zone? Or can it grow if it's just you know, depending on the funds from that particular zone, can several generations or many uh, employees get paychecks from that? And so while food is, of course, an important cultural touchstone and it's romantic, it's also a commodity and it's something that supports people and their families. So I've seen many ways in which food and tourism in particular have have allowed businesses to thrive. Certainly many vineyards in Sicily that now have visits that have accommodations. I know you're a big fan of Ariana Pinti. Her family has uh, like an agriturismo down there, which just doesn't help that family. It also means that if you're down there, you're gonna go to the other restaurants and maybe discover some other wines and then bring that knowledge home. Um, pistachios and almonds and, and things that are expensive and that most Sicilians can't purchase at full price. Well, you can sell almonds to tourists and they think they're getting a deal. So I think tourism, while we we have to of course be respectful of the full impact of it, it can 100% uh, fuel food preservation. And it's true no matter where you go. If there are people consuming the food, especially a, a, di a lost or disappearing dish, that could rescue it. And I think that's wonderful. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about Carla Publishing. Yeah, let's do it. Because I, um, one day I want to do a cookbook. I am not there yet. I have recipes, obviously, at the back of from scratch. Um, Before you say anything else, it's my duty to tell you, writing a cookbook will ruin your life. This is why I want to talk to you. Because I, <laughs> I, okay, on the consumer end, I show up in the bookstore 
And there used to be a wonderful bookstore here in LA um, that was just dedicated to cookbooks. It was on Third Street, long time ago. Um, now they're not serving in Chinatown. The, I mean, oh no, now serving is amazing. It's amazing. So anyway, um, but you walk in, you pick up a book and you're like, oh my God. And you it gives it for me all the feels. It is the intersection of beautiful visuals, cultural information, and then the utilitarian, like, oh, I can go home and, you know, make this. And I have a wonderful, extensive collection of cookbooks, vintage, new. I just love them as an art form. And um, so talking to, <laughs> hearing you talk about how they're actually made and the, the fact that they will ruin your life, you have to, because I know there are a lot of people listening who are like, oh my God, I love cookbooks. Okay, walk us through why cookbooks ruin your life. Uh, they are very expensive to make. You have to spend more than your advance to produce them. And that means you're not just working for free, you're actually losing money. And then you got to go out and sell something that you're not being properly compensated for. It feels terrible. But also what no one ever tells you is that writing 60,000 words and a hundred recipes and having them tested and managing all that, that's freaking easy compared to the iterative process of editing. So you send that manuscript away to your editor and you're like, I'm a genius. This is the best book ever written. And then it comes back and you've got two weeks to edit something that should really take six weeks to edit, but you got to turn it around. So hope you don't have a life or need to take a shower or change your clothes because you're going to have to press pause on all of that. So it's like, it's the incredible like mental and physical demand on like the production and editing that has stressed and threatened uh, not a few of my interpersonal relationships. <laughs> but I think something, the two things that drove Parla Publishing's foundation is I wanted creative control. I wanted to be able to say, I want a bold, fun book that makes people like dream about the sea and the mountains and Sicily and Sardinia immediately. I never could have done that. I don't sell a million copies. I sell 30,000 copies, which by cookbook standards is very good, but it's not influential. And I wanted to be properly compensated. No, I wanted to earn a living being a writer. And this is my seventh cookbook. I have, I'm so fortunate because my private tours have funded the rest of my careers. Writing doesn't get you rich. I know this is the first time everyone's hearing this. Being a writer doesn't make you rich, <laughs> with some exceptions, but it can make you very poor. <laughs> so, you know, just to like quickly break down, I don't want to bore anyone with stupid math, but uh, when you sign a cookbook contract, you're given an advance on royalties. So they do some calculations. The publisher says, I think they can sell this many copies and here's what we're going to do. Here's your check. We're going to give you four installments. Go out and make the book. And then you realize, okay, well, this check, which is a, for a quarter of my advance, is not gonna cover the testing, development, research, and photography that I have to pay for before I get my next check. Oh shit, I wish I had known that. But then you do it again and again and again, and then finally you do your taxes and you're like, oh my God, I lost $30,000 making this book, but my publisher didn't. Maybe there's another way. And so with like simple math, I deduce that if I produced Food of the Italian Islands myself, and had very modest sales that I knew I could run through my website. Uh, I could break even after 5,500 copies. And I did. And now I'm making 35 bucks a copy, which is pretty chill. Because that's never happened to me before. <laughs> Katie, the entrepreneur in me, the creator in me, is so friggin thrilled for you that you took the leap. I mean, this this podcast is called Lifted because it's this, hopefully, I think collectively when people listen to all of these conversations with women, they're gonna find a piece of inspiration that inspire, that lifts their life to either do the next thing or take some risk or love deeper or travel or whatever it is for them. But the fact that you were staring down the barrel of, I am a New York Times best-selling cookbook author and I am always behind the eight ball. Like I am not, and, and that is not sustainable. It doesn't work. It's draining down my battery. It's affecting my interpersonal relationships. And who am I serving? Mm -hmm. And then to say, okay, how do I pivot? And now figure out a new path and your path, Parla Publishing, I is so genius. And I'm so happy for you. Can you tell us about 
why that moment was so joyful and also how that you were giving a local work. I mean, talk about microeconomics, right? Of giving, staying within Italy, you were giving a printing press work. Tell us about that moment. I was so giddy pressing, doing the press check. I couldn't believe that they let me do anything in that factory that I was doing. I was like allowed to push the pallets of paper and I could like load things. I'm like, is this really okay? <laughs> like, are you sure? So I printed the book in Brescia and had it bound in Bergamo. And I oversaw the, the sort of various phases of uh, color testing and stuff the first day that the book was going to print. Um, and it was wild because I literally didn't know anything about printing before, before that, you know, as an author, you send your very last version of the, of the book to your editor. And then it's like, you see the finished copy and you don't know what happens. Um, and so I got to follow everything that was going on. And it was the first book that I had completely made myself and I couldn't believe that I had done it. So I was like pretty stoked. Well, you know, I'm publishing the Angelini Osteria cookbook too, because they wanted to publish <laughs> their own cookbook. And I was like, good, don't do it with a corporate publisher. Like, let me do it for you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Katie, what is your middle name? Anne. Katie and Parla, because in where <laughs> I come from, when you really want to like throw down with someone and you're just like, girl, I see you, you have to throw in the middle name. Katie and Parla, what did you just drop? That is going to be awesome. For people who don't know, this is a wonderful, beloved restaurant here in LA, Italian restaurant. And I'm so happy that they're, okay, I will be in line. I know that the launch party for the book will be incredible here in LA. What lifts you personally, Katie? What just like is your, I, I read somewhere, someone described it as they said, you know, this thing reduces me to joy. Like you just like, oh my God, I am helpless in front of this because I'm so joyful. What brings you joy? The most joyful that I am is when at the end of a tour, look, I, I'm a writer, but I hate it and I'm bad at it and I don't want to do it. Okay. The touring is really what is like the coolest part of my life. So at the end of a tour, like a nine-year-old or a 59-year-old being like, this experience totally changed my confidence in encountering your city. And that means that they will instantly connect more easily with the future people that they encounter because they won't be shy they won't be terrified of making a mistake and they'll be able to connect with people in a way that they wouldn't have before. And that's, that's the coolest thing. If you look forward 20 years from now, 30 years from now or beyond, and someone is standing in front of a bookshelf with all Kitty Parla's books, what do you want them to feel or think about your body of work? I want them to feel like I introduced them or was the catalyst for them being introduced to Molise or rural Sardinia um, and that I discourage them from going to Florence. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, that I, I allow them to discover Italy. You know, it's, I, I think about this all the time. Like I, I don't think you can know Italy unless you've been to all the big famous places, but then also like the industrial park in Bergamo or the like terrible ski lodge in uh, the Freeland Dolomites, like all of those things, like even the terrible gritty or sketchy ones are part of, are part of Italy. And you have to know them all to, to really get a sense of this place. Yeah. So a lot of what my initial work was, was travel writing. And so I want those books, not just to be something that people cook from, but that inspires them to take a trip or get to know a place that maybe they've never heard of before, or maybe they had given a back seat to because Rome, Florence, and Venice loom too large. I love that. And I think you're well, well, well on your way to doing that. I am so inspired by you. I have loved this conversation. It is way too short. I want to do like three, four parts with you and unpack so many nuanced things, particularly about the influence of the immigrant culture in Italy now. 
I'm so honored that you took time to chat with me and with listeners today and talk about what inspires you, what lifts you, what what you're curious about, what drives you, and um, that we could celebrate with you. Thank you so much. Your thoughtful questions were incredible, and I'm I'm honored to be here. So grazie, bellissima. Vieni a trovarmi presto. Lifted is developed, written, and produced by me and my one-woman producing team, Celia Cates. It is edited by Jamie Moss. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for our next inspiring episode.